Next up, we have U of L. Um, I understand that Dr. Brenda Pudi is uh, under the weather today, and uh, we have Provost Beth Bean. And, and Rick Bracerak is here for from finance, but I'll be presenting. Okay. <laughs> Originally, it's just so that you know, um, Neely had every intention of being here, so. I doubt that she sent a letter explaining her absence because it was just last night that she decided she was too sick. She's had the flu for the last week. Um, and we had our own board meeting yesterday and I think that it did her in. So she asked me if I would present. So please be patient with me because I was not expecting to do this until last night. Um, so um, let me begin um, by saying that uh, as the state's metropolitan research institution we are interested not only in our undergraduate and graduate student performances, but also in our research um, enterprise. And I just want to make sure that everyone here knows that yesterday, Pfizer invested $11 million in our Center for Excellence in Epidemiology and Infectious Disease um, to start a center that was going to that is going to address um, global issues of health. So it's very timely given what's going on in China. Um, and one of the reasons they chose um, Louisville as their only United States Center for Excellence, they're going to have several in other countries, um, is because we, our population in Louisville clearly is representative of the populations at large in other cities. Um, and they think that we have the right mix of um, ethnic minorities, immigrants, white people, you know, to, to represent the, um, the nation. And so that's a big coup for um, Julio Ramirez, who is our researcher, and we are quite excited about that partnership. And it's 11 million in the first year, and they expect that to continue and to grow. So that's, that's a, a, a good thing for our, our students, our community, and the state. Um, so overall, um, I want to just sort of make some comments about the graduation rate. We have shown consistent growth um, when we started tracking this um, years ago. Evidently, we were around 28% for a six-year graduation rate. You know, we were the community's urban institution, um, something of a commuter college in those days, and people stopped in and stopped out and took quite a while um, to get their degrees. I have been at the institution for 32 years. I've only been provost since Neely arrived, so 18 months, I think she likes to say. Um, but I remember having a student my very first semester here, and then eight years later, he was in another class of mine, and I said, what are you doing? I said, it's taking you longer to get a degree than it took me to get tenure. And he said, I'm just on this like eight-year plan. So we have shifted that. Um, and we have, have greatly improved, but we had a long way to go. I don't want to um, underestimate that. Um, so we are at 58.6% uh, this year, rounded up to 59. Um, and we expect to achieve our goal of 60.1. We're at 97.5% of that goal right now. Um, with our URM population, um, because the numbers are relatively small, changes of a few students can change a percentage point. So we actually closed the gap in 27-18. We were recognized nationally for that. Um, APLU, which is the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, um, had me give a presentation on how we did that. And the first thing I said to them is that we did that in 27-18. We're likely to lose a few students. We did, and so we dropped by, um, uh, a slight decline of 1.7% from 2017-18 when we closed the gap to 2018-19. Um, we are hard at work on making sure that we keep that gap close. Um, it's still, I think, the best gap in the, the Commonwealth, um, but we will work hard to make it better. We are truly committed to the diversity of our students and not just the diversity of our students, but their success. So um, we do a lot of things to try to increase that. We have a trio um, student support um, service program that's got an almost, I think it's uh, um, on the back of this handout. Um, uh, it's got a 67% six-year graduation rate. They have a 91% first-year retention rate. 
All right, so that program, which addresses underrepresented students, students with disabilities and um, underfunded students uh, has been hugely successful. And so we have a waiting list of about 90 students who wanna get into that program. And so right now we are looking at how we can expand it to so that we have no waiting list um, because it's been so successful. Um, low income um, students, we are showing consistent growth, um, an increase um, in graduation rates of 1.2%. That's where we struggle though, to be honest. Um, we have not had as much um, uh, to invest in aid, all right? And that's what is the biggest issue for our underfunded students, right? They need more aid. We are shifting our aid. We're currently from 8% of our total aid for need base to 20%. That's a big shift in a year. Um, we will tr continue to try to grow that and we're trying to grow the number of um, need-based scholarships through, through philanthropy as well. So the aid we have, we're shifting, but we're also trying to raise money for more yeah, need-based aid. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I also want to suggest that one of the things that makes U of L unique, um, Neely would certainly say this, is that there are 130 uh, institutions in the country that are R1 out of the 4,500 plus institutions overall. So we're one of those 130 along with UK. Those are the two R1 um, head high research institutions in the state. Um, we also are one of the um, community and high level community engaged institutions. We are one of about 400 of those out of again, those 4,500 institutions. And if you do a Venn diagram of R1s, community engaged, there are only 69 institutions that are both a high level community engaged and a high level research one. And we are that. Additionally, we are almost 40% Pell eligible. All right, so we are doing a lot with research and a lot with our poorest students. All right, so Pell eligible um, is the proxy for underfunded students. Um, and that is very unusual. UK also has a very high, large, uh, high level of um, Pell at 23%. So they're high for a research one, we're higher for our Pell eligible. So we, and these are expensive students to educate both because they have more need and also because they're often first generation and have um, needs, need, need re extra resources to help them be successful. Um, so I think that's an important thing to know about our profile. Um, in terms of degrees awarded, we've shown consistent growth in overall uh, baccalaureate degrees since the baseline year of 2015, 2016. The, the thing that um, uh, Provost Blackwell suggested about as we are successful in graduating more and more students, we've had record years the last two years, it does impact enrollment. They're not hanging on for those eight years like that student I told you about. Um, so they are getting out and so you don't have the high, I mean, it does impact enrollments. It's again, the way we want to impact your role. So we're, we're glad to have those students graduate. Um, we um, are about 95% of our goal for underrepresented um, minority baccalaureates. Again, I, I suggested that our struggle was to maintain a consistent increase for our low income baccalaureates, although we are, we are aware of the problems and we're working hard to help them. We have, one of the things we've done, we have student success counselors that we have aimed particularly at high risk students and high risk can be determined by a combination of things under preparedness. So we know by ACT scores that these students might struggle in some of their classes. But even more than that, we know that given their um, BASFA ratings that, that students who have low income or Pell eligible need more support. And so we have student success coaches assigned to those high risk students and they can deal with anything from an academic problem to a financial problem. And we, we do provide um, small just-in-time loans for students to keep someone out of homelessness or to um, uh, pay off a small bill so that they can register for the next semester. So um, those student success coaches, we added five this year and they are busy. So I think we're up to 11 total. Um, and they are, so we almost doubled them, but they're very busy. Um, STEM plus H baccalaureates, we saw kind of consistent growth. We increased by almost 2% from 2017 to 18 to 2018, 19. Like UK, we've been trying to develop new programs that address some of STEM needs. Um, one of the places where we feel like we have made great progress 
is in our public health school, which has grown phenomenally. It's a fairly new school and they started an undergraduate degree about four or five years ago and it's, it's finally um, producing graduates. And those, they have one of the higher, of, of all of our colleges, one of the higher um, Pell eligible student bases. I think they're at 45%. And um, so th that's giving a lot of opportunity for STEM plus H degrees to our underrepresented students. Um, uh, we are also showing consistent growth in our graduate and professional degrees. Um, you probably know that in terms of um, MDs and DDS, our, our dental and medical students, there are limits based on accreditation to how we can grow those programs. So they're fairly flat and probably will remain flat unless we um, uh, magically um, uh, change the accreditation rules. It's, it's really a faculty to student ratio issue. Um, and so we're not likely to grow those much, but we are growing our graduate programs, our PhD students and master's students in particular. In particular. Um, uh, overall undergraduate enrollment, um, we are flat, I think. And um, last year we had a 1.5% increase in overall enrollment from fall of 2018 to fall of 2019, largely due to greater retention efforts to keep people. Um, but overall our enrollment is not growing quite as much as we would like it to. I think we have faced a few really tough years at the University of Louisville um, with changing leadership. And I think that we are finally um, riding that ship and that I expect that we will um, have a small but consistent growth from, from here on. Um, I think we have stopped shooting ourselves in the feet. Um, uh, and, and, and Neely is a, a wonderful leader and I, I feel very confident. Um, our, we have shown strong growth in our underrepresented minority. Um, since the baseline year of 2015-16, we had a 21.4% increase. Um, we are already at 102% of our 2021 goal. So we are adjusting that goal. Um, we had an 8.7% increase in African-American enrollment since the baseline year and a 35.3% increase in Hispanic enrollment. These have been very um, uh, strategic and um, committed efforts over the past few years at um, making sure that our, our um, students um, of color succeed. So it's not just enrolling them, um, it's making sure that they are successful. Um, we've also um, uh, had a pretty strong adult um, undergraduate enrollment. Um, we have, that's declined in the last four years. Um, and I think that one of the things that we were trying to do, we had a cards come back um, effort this summer that brought back uh, 60 students who all graduated in December. They were all within one semester's um, at work of, of graduating. So we have 60 degrees of people who had stopped out with no intention to come back, except for that we reached out to them. So we are going to continue that. I would like to say those were the low hanging fruit because we knew they had to finish in a semester. We offered scholarships, only half the scholarships we offered were accepted because their employers paid for them to come back, all right, and, and made up the whole cost. So we didn't even have to use all the scholarship money for them that we had offered them. Um, so I think that's a win. It's a small pilot program we were doing and we hope to, to expand that to get um, um, those students with some credit back into our institution. Um, let's see. Um, our graduate enrollments increased by 3.6% since the baseline year of 2015. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm, I, you don't know this, but I was the former graduate dean. Um, and one of the things I'm proudest of is that we increased our underrepresented minority graduate enrollment since that baseline year of 2015, 2016 by almost 30%. Right? And that was through very conscious efforts and retention programs that have kept those students here by creating cohorts where within their programs there were no cohorts. Um, and then um, the first year to second year retention is a pretty, it's been pretty consistent. Um, uh, we are at about 80.3%. Um, we went down 0.2% this year from 80.3 to 80.1. I do want to say that just 
this January though, we were up a hundred students from last January. So we did a better job of retaining our students this year than we did last year. So that's, you know, and that again, while we don't have a table of 75, we do have a pretty big uh, group of advisors, student success counselors, vice provosts, um, and even budget who meet regularly to talk about how we can reach out to our students and change a culture of it's okay to drop courses. You know, we're trying to get everybody to take 15 to finish. And so that's a little bit of a change of culture on our campus. Um, let's see, um, average credits at um, graduation, um, it's decreased every year since the baseline year, which is a good thing. Um, uh, we have some of the same issues with dual enrollment credits and how they count. Um, we also have some issues with transfer credits and how they count that, that artificially um, up the number of hours to degree. And then of course, we have a lot of engineering degrees that are a higher credit hour than other degrees. Um, one thing that I would point out in this way is that we have, I, I know that high credit hours often means more debt, but U of L has the lowest median student debt of all the Kentucky publics. Um, and according to the most recent Georgetown University's um, report on the college return on investment. So we're proud of that. So even though our, our credit hours might be up a little bit, um, the debt is not. Um, success of underprepared students, um, we do quite well in English. Um, we had a little bit of a drop in English from the baseline year, and we think that's largely due to dual credit enrollments, taking the highest performing English students out of our 101 and 102 classes because they get credit before they come. And so that the students who are left might include a few more of the weaker students. Um, we're not sure, we're just, we're, we're, we're delving into that right now and student by student to figure out what it is that's caused that little bit of a drop. Math, we have um, shown a great improvement over three years. We were at 10.3% in fall of 2015, and we're up to 30%. That is way too low still, and we are working hard on that. We have made a change in our math department. Um, uh, the long time, I think he'd been chair for at least 15 or 20 years, has stepped down. He's a great guy, but he was rigid. Like me, he's of German ex ex um, background, and us Germans sort of sometimes like to stick to uh, a certain formula and he was rigid and we have worked to get around that rigidity and I think we will make progress. Um, one of the things that we have done that has shown great progress is we have partnered with APLU to um, uh, use um, adaptive courseware to help students make their way through math so that if they know how to do a certain formula, they can skip that and go on to the work that they don't know how to do and work on that. That has made a huge um, change. I think there's like a almost a 95% success rate for the students who are using that adaptive courseware. The department had been resistant to that and now they are experimenting and seeing success. And I, I, I expect this to grow um, um, over the next few years. Um, average net price and total cost of attendance. Um, we, um, our average net price increased by $90 between 2016 and 2017-18. We've had a 5.2% increase between 2015 and 2017-18. Um, I would say that UK's is almost double that increase. Um, we've had um, a total cost of attendance has been a 1.7% increase between 2016-17 and 2017-18. And the total, cost of attendance is 9.5 to 2017-18. But you'll notice that the average net price only rose by 5.2%. So what is total cost of attendance and what they pay, there's a big difference in the UML because we have so many fellow students. Um, so I will end there and let you ask questions. I want to, let me just make one comment about the handout that we gave. Um, what We've completed a strategic plan this fall and we are implementing it now. And the plan is to make U of L, and Neely may have said this last year, a great place to learn, a great place to work and a great place to invest. And you can see some of the accomplishments we already have just in this first year of, of Neely's tenure. Um, but we are, and the red, the red bullet points or number points up at the top are the key areas. And one of the things that we are working on that we think is gonna be a, a, a big game changer 
is providing every student with experiential learning. Um, that is important to Neely, it's important to the Strategic Planning Committee, and it has become important to the deans. So we are all looking hard to provide on um, either, so we have a few um, entrepreneurial uh, uh, partnerships with um, business on our campus where students can work for Humana by working on campus in a particular hub where they are doing call work um, and they can get paid to do that, right? So we're looking for, for paid internships. Um, we have a big program with the state that's providing um, uh, internships to work in state offices and our political science students are really the benefactory of that um, partnership. We have other partnerships with IBM, um, Pfizer now, um, and others that will, will provide opportunities to our students. And we are gonna keep growing that. Um, uh, and so that's already started. Um, on the front of it, we have cardinal principles. This is um, uh, what we are trying to do to improve our culture um, on, on campus with students and with faculty and staff. So with that, I will turn it over to you for questions. Question, Richard. Thank you for your report. Um, <clears throat> a lot of good numbers here. There's something you said that I haven't heard from any of the other reports, and it was impressive to me. Um, so I've got two questions. It was uh, related to the median student loan debt mm -hmm. of all the Kentucky public universities that you have the lowest. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed with that and wondering if you are purposely trying to help students leave with less debt. And then secondly, what is that average student loan debt? Um, okay, it's on it's on CPE's website. Um, it's, it's we're about a um, thousand lower than the next interest. So it's about 27, I wanna say, but please don't hold me to that. It's, it's in that area of total debt um, or average debt that students get out with. Many of our students, Many of our students, particularly our um, low-income students, get out with almost no debt. All right, and so our efforts are to really keep debt low. We do it with some of these micro loans that are not micro loans, micro grants that we give to students who uh, to keep them from taking additional loans out to pay off a bill. So this year, one of the reasons that we were very successful in getting an extra hundred students back in January over last year is because we provided small amounts between I think a thousand dollars and twenty nine hundred to students to pay off debt from last semester so that they could start fresh this semester and register so that was a big I mean it's not a lot of money but to them it's a lot of money and so um, I think that um, those are some of the intentional things that we're doing um, and I think that uh, you know one of the things if you look at college loan debt um, one of the problems hits our underrepresented students hardest because those students take out bigger loans often because they have less family income to come from and they also have less financial awareness of what that will, how that will impact them. And that's a group we are working with to change that national narrative at the University of Louisville so that those okay. students in particular, so we're doing a better job of providing financial literacy um, uh, courses that they can take and also helping to meet the needs so they don't have to take out such large loans. Good question. I've got one, if I may, even though I was late, my apologies for that. Um, Universal is my alma mater, so this is uh, particularly important to me. From a personal perspective, with the underrepresented uh, minorities, there's a, a fluctuation. Right. I guess. I don't know, and I apologize for already explaining that. If you talk a little bit about what that is. Um, well, we're not 100% sure what that is, we, but it's small numbers. That's one of the things is so that when the N is low, a few students less makes a big percent, right? So that's part of it. The other part that I think, and, and this is one of the things when we were looking at these numbers this year, um, we have our IR, um, we, have, we, have, we hired last year a student success um, analyst, and he is looking into this one by one. And what he said his initial look suggested was that we have been recruiting um, uh, from uh, out of state, uh, and particularly the Chicago and DC areas. We've recruited a lot of minority students from those areas. And that seems to be where we've lost some students. And we think it might be homesickness. And so 
we are with the Chicago group this year, we did a, a, a pretty good job of creating a cohort of Chicago students. So at least they, they hung with people who came from Chicago, right? You know, and creating that, like there are a lot of you here, so we want you to know each other. And we're hoping that that will help improve that. But I think it has something to do with some of our students from out of state who are homesick. And even, even students from Eastern Kentucky get homesick, right? And, and uh, wanna go, so. Beth, I don't want to answer the question for you, but I want to point out how graduation rates, retention rates work on trends. Right. Now, there's always things that can change, right? Those inputs can make a change. But if you look at 15, 16, you notice you had a 51.1, you went down to a 47.7, one the next year. Then you shot up past that 51, the year after that, the 56, then you went down to 54. Right. Right. So if the trend analysis stays true, three years make a trend, you will be higher right. next year. That's the way rates work. That's right. And, and for those who follow this, you have to understand that's the way it works. What you're hoping to see in the trend, the line going this way. And your line is going that way right. in the trend. So once again, I don't want to be the statistician for you, but right. that's that's what you have to think. You look at then the inputs that you had or didn't right. have. Right. to get where you get and hopefully those are exaggerated again so your number will be higher that's right and, and especially with the low end to start the trends have to go in the right direction but every year might be a little bit of a dip or a little bit of an increase so it's variable thank you other questions yeah, just me, just a simple comment to amplify a bit. point on, on retention of uh, the chicago group that's what they in the uh, CEO of the Committee on Equal Opportunity, one of the things that we hear most often on retaining both students and faculty is that they have a community that they can identify with. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that's very critical and a shortcoming in some areas of the state just because we don't have that type of community. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you know, we have one of the most diverse workforces of all the Kentucky public institutions. I think we're only second only to KSU. Um, and so that helps retain uh, minority students as well as if they can see faculty who look like them and staff who look like them. And so we are constantly working to, to increase that diversity as well. Um, and so I think you're right, it's a community of fit here, but also seeing that this is a place where the faculty and staff also reflect them. I think it's only fair to point out Rich's question. If you look at student loan debt, I think the average of everybody is 28,000 in Kentucky, but African Americans underrepresented are over 32, over right. 33. So there is a disparity, if you will, or a gap that That's exists right. in that particular area. That's right. And nationally, it's even a, a bigger it's gap. Larger. It's a much larger gap between um, white student loan debt. And underrepresented minority debt. So, and we're work, we, we are aware of that trying to mitigate it. Thank you, Beth. Sure, Appreciate thank you. Appreciate your presentation. We'll take five minutes.